one of those days, you know. And I was trying to remember what we had to review, but we don't have any review because you did your test. And wait for it. Great job. <laughs> On test number two. I think it might have been a, a record time for me. I did make the adjustments and marked your uh, your kind of your interpretations. Uh, I guess on Tuesday, um, so you can look at the feedback. And if I made adjustments, then I'll have made a note there. Um, and but if you have any questions, then probably send them in an email because otherwise I'll forget. It's kind of my to do list. My inbox is my to do list. Okay, so today there's no review because you did the test and you all did a good job, great job, I should say. And so today we're gonna start the last chapter of the textbook, chapter seven, which is on unsupervised learning. Which makes you think that there is supervised learning and of course there is. Um, and uh, it's been all the previous chapters that we've talked about, right? And so um, really what the unsupervised part is saying is that we can extract information. We can extract information from data without specifying a model. from data without specifying a model. Versus supervised learning. Which we saw in, oops, use the bracket chapters four, five, and six, right? Chapter four was, uh, was what? Oh yeah, regression, and then five was classification, and then six was uh, kind of machine learning things. Um, so chapters four, five, and six, but for all of those methods that we talked about, we have to specify, okay, I wanna predict this value. Right. I want to use these variables, not necessarily all of them. Right. And so we we really still have a lot to say. So where we need to specify the outcome as well as the predictors, as well as the predictors. and even which predictors to include. Okay. We can think of unsupervised learning as kind of an extension of exploratory data analysis. It's like a, a level up on exploratory data analysis where we're using the data to essentially create more variables, right? That kind of capture all the data information. And so we can, we can use unsupervised learning Uh, techniques, I guess, techniques as an extension of exploratory data analysis, 
as an extension of exploratory data analysis, kind of coming full circle. Usually we call exploratory data analysis EDA because we don't want to write that out so much, right? Things that we do are we're going to establish clusters uh, in our data and then we can use those clusters as new predictors. So, uh, 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 uh. yeah, not necessarily. Yeah. So we can use unsupervised learning techniques as an extension of exploratory data analysis to help establish clusters. in our data, for example. Those clusters can then be used, oops, be used as predictors. data. So today, I want to introduce kind of the two most common ones that we use. Uh, K-means clustering is, is probably the most common, but we're going to start with uh, principal component analysis, PCA. Uh, so today, we will introduce two main clustering techniques. First one is the principal component analysis. PCA. And the second one is k-means clustering. And I know we've seen it in lots of different courses, so I'm not too concerned. It should be relatively familiar by now. We've even seen, uh, we've seen k-means before, right, and k-means predictions. Um, yeah, I'm sure you've seen it a lot. Have you guys seen a lot of PCA? Mm. Good. That's great. Then you get to see it again. No sweat. Makes for a, a nice end of the term, I think. Every time we see something, you'll pick up on something new, and I think it's good. K means, oops, clustering. I will say here, that this is likely the one you'll use the most. As you've seen already, then you know before you do anything, you have to standardize your, your data, right? So be sure be sure to standardize all the variables all the variables before using either of these techniques either of these techniques oops even do an exclam exclamation mark. It's going to look crammed, but there's a page break. So we'll start with principal component analysis.
I keep doing colons, but I don't want to. One thing that we're gonna keep in mind here is that PCA can only be applied to numerical variables. So that's, that's kind of our main thing. So if we have categorical variables, I have to pull them out, but PCA can only be applied to numerical variables. So I think of uh, principle, PCA is kind of weaving together all the variables that we have into kind of new variables that incorporate all of the other variables, right? And so it's, it's a way of, uh, of decreasing our predictors, but still incorporating all of them. Mm -hmm. So PCA, I keep writing it weird. PCA combines multiple multiple numeric predictors, right? We said that before, but, uh, or predictor variables into a smaller set of variables, not initially, but ultimately, this is why we're doing it, a smaller set of variables, which are which are weighted linear combinations of the original set. We're going to denote it Z I. Z I, the weights come from W. So W I one for X one. So predictor variable X one. If I only have two predictor variables, then I'm going to have W I two X two. The weights for the first Z for X one is W I one. The weight for X two is WI2 for the total ZI. Okay. So this here is the weight for the ith principal component which we denote by ZI applied to X1. Which is the first predictor variable. In terms of our Zs, we're gonna calculate as many Zs as we had predictors. We calculate the same number of Zs as we have predictors in our data as we have predictors in our data. <clears throat> the weights, so in this case, WI1, WI2 are called the component loadings, which are the weights, right? So, but these are called the component loadings. Uh, 
but we can just call them weights if we want to, right? But it's principal component analysis. And so we're talking about these components and the component loadings. Okay. We already called ZI the principal component. And so Z1 is the first principal component. It just tries to capture as much of the, of the variability as it can. And so it's the first principal component. which is a, the weighted combination, of course, like we just saw the weighted combination and maybe I should say linear combination since I'm adding them up. The weighted linear combination, I'll specify of the original predictors, that best explains the total variation. This is a simplified case where we only have X1 and X2. And so now we can really kind of spend some time and we can talk about, we can visualize it as soon as we're, we're beyond two, then it's really hard to visualize it, but it, it keeps going in the same way. In theory, I guess we could do three, like a three D situation, right? But um, for us, I'm gonna try to keep it on the same page here. Totally, exactly. So now, if I've got this kind of uh, relationship here. Right, something like this, that's not very beautiful, but whatever, right? Then of course my, my first, my go-to move to try to capture this is to say, okay, well, ZI is, is gonna be going this way, okay? So just kind of, all right, trying to capture what's going on here, right? The full, the stretch of this data. My, Second component is orthogonal, which kind of depends on if you're talking about matrices or it all means the same thing, but orthogonal just means it's perpendicular. Right? And so now you've got this kind of, you're capturing the, the width of this oval as well in Z2. So Z2 is, orthogonal, 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 yeah. Which in terms of statistics means that it's independent, right? So statistically independent. So is orthogonal to the first principal component. ZI or Z1. <clears throat> and in general, right, any future Zs are also going to be orthogonal to the previous sets. Right, so any any z i, and just as a reminder, right, we have as many z's as we have original predictors, and then we kind of cut z's as we don't need them anymore. Right, if they're contributing very little, then we can kind of ax them, and that's how we decrease the number of predictors. So I'll just make a note here. Remember, we calculate. as many Zs 
as we have predictors. In our data, oops, I was gonna say on our data, in our data. So any zi will be orthogonal to the rest of the zs. Once we've generated all these zs, right, then we can uh, we can keep as many as we want or feel that we need, right? But usually the goal is to try to decrease the number of predictors because we've got this overwhelming data set and we need to kind of decrease the predictors a little bit. Um, how about this? Once we have calculated, We're not going to calculate anything, but once we have uh, all the Zs, yeah, as many as we need, the number of predictors. Yeah. So once we've calculated all the Zs, we retain the top components. needed to account for for most of the variance or some some threshold amount of variance or percentage of, of variability to account for most of the of the variance or some threshold variability or amount of variance, I guess. <clears throat> For example, if we have Z1, Z2, Z3, Z4, Z5. So we've got our components here. And each one is going to capture variability. Can't spell or write or anything today. Right, some variability. We start with the main one. Right, so that Z1, it looks for the obvious one to capture. And so it's gonna capture the most of the variability. So let's say 60%. And then the second one, right, has a good chunk to choose from as well. Let's say 15%. And then how about the remainder, just 2%, 2%, 1% can keep going, right? I haven't made sure that these are less than 100, but let's assume it is. Right, and so maybe, maybe I'm okay with just if I look at this and I say, okay, well, I'm actually fine with just maybe 77% of the variability and then I can cut all these other ones, right? And then I've reduced the data set, but still incorporated all of the variables that were originally there. How about for, for argument's sake, make it more obvious, right? Five. So here, if we want to capture, let's say 80%, right? The first three components capture uh, 80% of the variability. Right. And if we're satisfied with that, then we can retain those and ditch the others. 
Um, if you guys talked about PCA, you might have talked about, uh, I have to look it up, correspondence analysis, which is basically the same, but with categorical variables. If you have categorical variables. Yeah, it's, um, I guess it's not very common in big data settings, so it makes sense, but I'll just mention it here because I mean, otherwise you're kind of stuck, but uh, it's one of those things, it's helpful to remember that, oh, there, something exists and then you can go and, and find it, right? So um, remember PCA is only used uh, with numeric variables. For categorical variables, We can use correspondence analysis. Which is similar, but not uh, very useful in big data settings. but not very useful in big data settings. We have other ways of dealing with categorical variables. I've never done correspondence analysis, or at least I don't remember doing it. It's possible. <laughs> don't remember everything I've done, but uh, so it's possible, but I, I don't remember doing it, so. Um, good. So correspondence analysis is similar to PCA, but it doesn't actually do it. Yeah, so it's, it's kind of um, presumably the same idea, but you're dealing with a lot of binary variables. Yeah, I, I just don't really see it. Maybe it looks at the groups or something. I don't know. Maybe it would be fun to look into it, but I don't, I don't, I don't know. I don't know. Um, so that's basically PCA in a nutshell here. And I want to just do the same thing with k-means clustering, which I know you've seen a lot of especially because even I've told you guys about uh, k-means clustering. And so that's why I'm kind of glossing over it, but it is a nice way to end the term, I think. So k-means clustering, oops, clustering, clustering. Just a reminder, right? Remember to standardize the data. I think I made that note because I probably forgot to standardize at some point. <clears throat> so uh, k-means clustering, and I think there are a couple of different types, but most commonly we just randomly assign our data into all these different groups, and then we calculate the means of those groups, and then we, we reallocate all our data points, and then we recalculate the centers, uh, and then that's how we develop these clusters until things stop moving, which is kind of a fun idea. I think it's a cute thing of like, you're imagining all these points kind of running to their groups, <laughs> right? And so, so that's how I kind of imagine, oh, I'm more like this guy, and I run over there. And so, uh, there is an algorithm, but I think it's cuter to think of it that way. So given some desired number of clusters,
which of course we're going to call K, capital K. The typical algorithm for K means clustering. Goes as follows. First thing I'm going to do is randomly assign each response each response to one. Oops. To one of the K clusters. We're going to calculate the mean, which is often a, a vector, right? It's not just one variable. Obviously, we're going to look at multiples, but you're going to calculate the mean, or what it does is it calculates the mean, which is a vector, oh, vector in this case, for each cluster. What does this mean? It means that there's a, a list. So a vector is basically a list of the mean uh, for each variable in the data. For each variable in the data. You don't just have one mean, you have multiple means and together they make up that group mean. Then this is where all the observations kind of run to, oh, I'm more like these. How do we decide, oh, I, I am more like this group on average? Well, we need some distance, obviously, um, which we're going to use the Euclidean distance. Presumably, you can use Manhattan distance or some other distance, but uh, Euclidean is fine. And so all observations. are relocated to the cluster with the mean closest, closest to the observation. Closest means that we're going to have to calculate a distance, right? Requires a distance calculation, which I made you do on the test. Right. So, in terms of the closest, all right, that's kind of a vague term, but uh, we're going to want to, we want to minimize the sum of the square distances, right, um, for each record or observation we've been calling them. So we want to minimize the sum of the squared distances um, of each record or observation. to the mean of its assigned cluster. Not necessarily, but. All 
that's where we're going to end up. That's how it decides. Then, of course, we recalculate the means. Seems reasonable. And we do it all over again. Recalculate the means. And then we relocate to observations. to the closest cluster. And then we're gonna repeat steps four and five until there's no more movement. Until the observations in the clusters do not change. The cluster sizes are usually not the same and that's okay, right? And so here, final cluster sizes are usually different. I'm trying to keep it on the same page, but that's okay. Because it's just trying to find Okay, so this cluster, if I uh, now talk about, okay, the clusters, then that's capturing all that similar information. Right? And so it's okay if they're different sizes. That's all I've got. Guess I could keep going. But what do I have? Nah. You guys had a test this week and probably you've got more going on than just this class. Mm. Mm, let me remind myself, where do you think I have that? Desktop. Okay. So you're going to use, use the loan 200 and then use K equals 15. So I have two questions. First, mm -hmm. one is that they have done it on the first observation when you have it, right? Yeah. It can end in the yeah. first round. Yeah. So when you're going to do it on the first observation, it can mm. be in the first round. Yeah. I would remove that first one because it's not helpful. Yeah, I should specify here. And that's a good call. I just didn't want you to do the first one because they've already done the first one. Yeah, so yeah, so you could. Yeah, I'm I mean, I'm, I'm open to if you want to use impute the uh, the predicted value, that's totally fine. That's great. That works. Uh, and then you could do the fifth one, or if you want to cut the first one and use that as your new data set, right? I'm not looking for specific values. I'm just looking, you know, did you kind of do something other than the first one? Mm. Have you done those first steps that they do in the, in the code? Sometimes they adjust the order of things. 
So maybe that's maybe that's something that's going on here. Mm. Kind of tricky. I wonder. I don't know if it's going to show up on here, but let's try it. Okay. Yeah. So usually they do kind of stuff like, let's see here. Okay. Because that can, I know that can kind of make a mess sometimes. If I didn't have any trouble with the XGBoost, then also we're not using XGBoost in this lab, so you can kind of ignore this one. Um, but yeah, I, I do find that these, these commands that they have, right? Um, that code like the, um, uh, the JMR changes. Yeah. One. Yeah. It gives an error that the train and cross don't uh, have different lengths. Mm. Yeah, let's do that because it'll be easier if I can kind of reproduce the, the error. I feel like I had something similar. How did I fix it though? How did I fix it? Because what would you do? You would change this to five, yeah. right? Yeah, so you've got a couple of, yeah, you'd have to kind of deal with that first one first, and then you change this to five, but then you still want to talk about the second and the third variables. And then your test set is just that one row. You want to take out that one row from the full data set because that's yeah. Is probably the root of the problem because you'd have to remove what if you tried removing the first one yeah because if you're not fixing it so let's say let's say you remove it then you should be fine to just have the fifth one removed yeah yeah or even just send me your rmd file and i can kind of go through it and see yeah i think that would be easier and then this would change to 15. i remember i, I changed something here but i don't remember what it was uh, anyways one of those things probably easier if you show me but uh, yeah, I do know that these, the orderings can make a mess if you don't run those and they're not in the textbook, they're in the, in the code that you have. But I think with that, I'll stop my recording here.